everyone. Um, this is the last day, of course, of the uh, print fair, and I just want to start off by saying some of the things I said at the very beginning, how happy we have been to have all come together again after a long three-year hiatus. We have survived, and I think we all have thrived, and so a round of applause to all of you and to us. Thank you. So welcome to the last day of the IFPDA Print Fair. Welcome to the last day of Print Month, a day particularly rich in programming, this being the first of five uh, of what I'm certain will be remarkable presentations in this space today. Is it four or five, Jenny? Four, okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, Jenny Gibbs, our formidable executive director, and thank you to her young and energetic team for getting all this programming and the fair itself together, uh, incredible in its extent of detail and logistics. And thank you to the Javits and its personnel, uh, the union men and women, and the management who have become friends in these last uh, three, four years, um, some of them personal friends. We love this space and we have already begun to plan for next year. Stay tuned for those details. I'm David Tunick, the president of the IFPDA, and I want to express our deepest gratitude to the Metropolitan Museum, Jennifer, um, and whoever else may be here from the Metropolitan today for the partnership with the IFPDA, uh, which now goes back several years in bringing to you their great curators who to the last are highly informed, highly informative, and splendidly and articulate speakers. Uh, today, the subject is the magnificent opening display at the front of the fair, as you all know, the Derek Adams installation called Eye Candy. It's a real lollipop, it's dazzling, it's a knockout. No less dazzling and impressive is your moderator today, Jennifer Farrell, the curator of modern and contemporary prints and illustrated books at the Metropolitan Museum. Jennifer has generously given of herself and her valuable time in several print month events. You may have heard me say before that Jennifer's CV and credentials are prodigious. Rather than reciting them, we'll do something far better and ask her to come up here and get right into what is sure to be a fascinating conversation with the hero of the fair and the day, the magnificent artist, Derek Adams. Wonderful. Or, or from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the last day of the fair. I think we're all sitting when we, when we can. Um, <laughs> so it is my great honor to talk to Derek Adams today. He's an artist I very much wanted to meet for for some time, so to get to have a conversation is, is really incredible. Um, Derek Adams is a Baltimore-born, Brooklyn-based uh, artist whose work, which spans painting, collage, sculpture, performance, video, and sound installations, and of course, prints, this is why we're, we're all here for this particular talk, has received a wide degree of critical acclaim. He has worked with numerous print shops and printers, many of which we will discuss today. He received his MFA from Columbia University and his BFA from Pratt Institute. He is an alumnus of the Skohegan uh, School of Painting and Sculpture and the Mary Walsh uh, Sharp Foundation Studio Program. He's received numerous awards, including a Robert Rauschenberg Foundation Residency, a Gordon Parks Foundation Fellowship, a Studio Museum Joyce Alexander Wine Artist Prize, and a Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award. With his work, 
Uh, Derek probes how identity and personal narratives intersect with American iconography, art history, urban culture, and the black experience. He explores how individuals are shaped by their physical, societal, and historical environments. With sophisticated formal techniques, he investigates the fragmentation and manipulation of structure and surface, a method that links his work to such pioneers as Matisse, Hannah Hook, and uh, Romare Bearden. He is exhibited widely, including at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, uh, Performa, the Studio Museum, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Greater New York at uh, MoMA PS1, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He has also been the subject of numerous solo exhibitions at institutions that include the Henry Art Museum, Crystal Bridges, um, the Museum of Fine Arts, St. Petersburg, the Cleveland Art Museum, the Hudson River Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver, and the Museum of Arts and Design, and the gallery in Baltimore City Hall. He has created projects for the Museum of Modern Art, Rockefeller Center, which some of you may have seen this summer, which was absolutely wonderful, the Harlem Hospital Pediatric Emergency Department um, for RX Art, um, an organization on which he is on the board, and the Milwaukee Art Museum. His work resides in the permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the RISD Museum, the Portland Art Museum, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and the Birmingham Museum of Art. He has also recently established an artist program in residency in his hometown of Baltimore called The Last Resort. So, and he has created the magnificent print mural, Eye Candy, which we will discuss, which is on view here at the print fair. So please welcome Derek Adams. Thank you for having me. Hearing all of that is so overwhelming, but you know, I'm like, I, I did all that. Um, and I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm really loving the print fair and all the high quality work that I'm seeing here. I'm, I'm highly impressed. I, like from the first day I walked into the print fair, I was just blown away by the quality and range of work and subject matter uh, presented here. So I'm glad to be here. Well, we are very happy to have you here. So Derek has worked very widely in prints, and he continues to work in prints. So we have a lot of works to show. So I thought we would jump right into it, and um, we can have some questions at the at the end. So I'm starting with what I believe are some of your earliest yeah. your earliest the first prints, ones, yeah. your first prints, and I'm wondering these were made at Middlebury. I was wondering if you could say a few words about these works? At the time, I think 2012, when this print was uh, produced, I was invited uh, to Middlebury with a fellow, uh, I guess, alum from Columbia, Hedia Klein, who was the head of print um, mm -hmm. department at Middlebury. She invited me to come to Middlebury to do a print project that she had created a class around when artists would come in to uh, the class for two weeks and students who were part of this group would help to produce a print. And so that was the first time I actually, I mean, other than in school, like I, in undergrad, I did printmaking. It was the first time I was invited to do a professional print um, publication, um, which was at Middlebury, which for me was a really interesting challenge because honestly, at the time of making you know, unique works, I couldn't even imagine um, a, reprodu a reproduction of something I was doing until this particular op uh, opportunity. Also, it's it's so interesting that screen print and collage and your work at the time really didn't, in retrospect, of course, we could make a print yeah. from it, but did you have reservation about the, the flatness and what prints, um, the two-dimensional nature? Yeah, that was a challenge for mm -hmm. me because most of my collage work at the time was very much about being in the moment, mm -hmm responding to certain things in the studio. It was very uh, reactionary to the end product. And it was almost like a relief doing one thing, mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, I did that. So seeing it more than once to me was like, I don't want to see anything I've made more than one time in the world. That's what I first, mm -hmm. that's what I first thought. That was like my hesitation for not doing prints. And 
honestly, I didn't really know how to communicate the idea of embellishing prints mm -hmm. beyond just the silk screen process. And so this was my first introduction into how to do those things. But it was also an easier process because the person who invited me there was aware of my practice because she went to school with me. Mm -hmm. So she knew the many different steps it took from to have the outcome. So she was prepared. She was also very prepared in helping me to do these things because this particular piece, that's the larger piece, it's called uh, Human Structure with, with Multiple Facets and Accessories, was the first original work mm -hmm. that I made and I really didn't want to part with. And it was a very elaborate collage that I wanted to also share. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of it, and no one's ever seen the original work, and what I did is photographed it and I sent it to Hedia. And I, I, I guess initial where the collage elements were, mm -hmm. and she asked me to send the collage elements to the print shop ahead of my arrival. Mm -hmm. So when I got there, they had started with just a test print. Mm -hmm. And then we continued to develop the test print, but when I arrived, all of the collage elements were already cut out. Mm -hmm. And they were in the stack. Like they were like all assembled with the students. And when I stepped into the room, I was like, oh, you know, all the elements were laid out and it was like stations where mm -hmm. people, because she basically did all the research, asked me like, what kind of glue did I use? What type of uh, uh, finish, what kind of pencil I used to make the drawings? They basically, um, I sent them a whole description of all of my materials and all the things that I did to make the image. And when I reached uh, space, it was almost like I continued my studio practice in this new space because everything I was doing in my studio was continued through the printing process with starting again from scratch, but also having these other elements already organized. Mm -hmm. So it was a really interesting system that at first I worked always alone, so I never even knew how to delegate mm -hmm. like working in my studio because mm -hmm. I thought my studio was like more of a space of like, you know, privacy and discovery and experimentation without other people around. So that was the first real time that I had other people helping me do my work. Like in 2012 was the first time I had help um, creating a work. And it happened to be with printmaking. And how was that with delegating responsibility, delegating parts of the production? Well, it was definitely, I stepped right into it. I don't mm -hmm. think it, it was as complicated as I thought it was going to be because of the, again, Hedia, who was a master printer, mm -hmm. also knew how to assist me in communicating and getting the results that she thought I wanted mm -hmm. in working with uh, a print edition, but it also helped me to begin my professional career as an artist at another level that I had not entered, mm -hmm. and that was having assistance and having people help me to communicate things by having other hands operating um, mm -hmm through my vision, through my concept. Um, and it was a learning process, really, because there were a lot of tweaking, a lot of things, but also I learned patience. Mm -hmm. I learned just being in the moment, really, you know, because for me, being at a print shop is like playing around. And so you play with paint, mm -hmm. you play, you know, you make swatches, you do test prints, you, work, you mess with scale, all those things that in the studio, it does happen, but you feel more in the print shop that there's more options. Mm -hmm. You feel like when you're working, like, oh, this doesn't work. This, uh, like in my studio, I just feel like this has to work <laughs> when I'm working in my studio. Like I hate everything when I first start working on it, and my goal is to love it. Mm -hmm. And so I keep working through it until I like it, mm -hmm. you know, and then the world gets to see it. But printmaking was very public. Yeah. Yeah, so I had to really think and step away and have lunch and come back and, mm -hmm. you know, look at materials and do paint. And so it was, it was a lot more from my collaborative side of working with a master printer was really more about what, what I was trying to achieve and, and with the assistance of a master printer, could it be achieved? And you have your first studio assistant from that experience. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So that was the first time I actually had a studio assistant because mm -hmm. in that experience, which I, again, I never, I always worked alone. And it was kind of an issue because I could never really go out with my friends and do stuff because I was always in my studio because I'm a very prolific artist. 
I would just work till like three or four in the morning. You know, if you want to hang out with me, you had to come to my studio or meet me at a bar near my studio when I had a break. And so it was a situation because my friends were like, you never can meet us. You, I've never been to your studio, you know, those things. And when I did this project at Middlebury, I met this student. Well, it was a group of students, but one of the students stood out who was there helping me all the time, like the whole time. And at the end of my, uh, my visit there, he said to me, you know, I have credits for this, um, for, you know, working with an artist, and I'm wondering, can I come to New York next semester and help you in your studio? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. So he came to my studio, and we were working through the whole time, and I, again, we were used to working with each other, and then he said to me, you know, how did I do? And I said, you did great. And he said, um, so would you hire me as a studio assistant? And I was like, oh, now I have to pay. Uh, <laughs> and then... Um, and at the time, I was not like at a place to have like a, like I think that I really had to step up and really kind of become another type of artist where I had to start thinking about budgeting and thinking about paying someone and how much I could afford and those things. But I did say to him, I said, yeah, you know, when you're done, when you graduate, yeah. And so he called me the day of his graduation mm -hmm. and said, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just, I just graduated today. I'm moving to New York tomorrow, and I'm going to start work on Monday. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, oh, how are you going to do? You know? I guess give him your address. Yeah, so I had to sit down and, like, write out, like, all the things I needed yeah. help. And I realized that I really needed a lot of organization in the studio so I could actually work more uh, efficiently. And that's how our relationship started as a studio assistant and artist. Mm. And it's it's interesting, we'll be talking about several uh, different print shops, but um, that was working with a, a university, a college, working with, with students, yeah. which is, um, as we'll go along, it's a, probably a different experience than working with some of the master printers and, yeah. and different things. So this is Shade, which was uh, printed at the Lower East Side and uh, published by Laundromat, um, projects, which could you say a little bit about about that, about the work, as well as how this came together? Um, I think a lot of my work in general has like a lot of uh, duplicity mm -hmm. in it, and it means a lot of different things to different people. Um, this particular piece, for instance, is about casting light on something that is not necessarily visible mm -hmm. um, from like this candid uh, um, appearance. And, um, and so this particular composition, which was mostly grayscale, was, you know, a lamp mm -hmm. with a light shade casted on it. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea behind this particular piece and working with various uh, patterns to really talk about space mm -hmm. and light. And so I wanted to really strip down the colors and really focus on um, tonality to create volume and line. And so this piece, again, was not, like a lot of the prints that I, I make are prints that I just make. Mm -hmm. And then when an organization, and these are prints that I want to keep. These are original works I want to keep. Mm -hmm. And so some of these works become prints because I want to find out how to construct them from scratch because there's certain things that can't be translated as uh, exact in printmaking. So you have to think about like stripping down the, the palette sometimes working with the colors that are mm -hmm. available, even um, even uh, taking liberties and using other paint, uh, you know, combinations in a print shop, like sometimes a paint with like a shiny, glittery surface that may not necessarily be in the original painting. So it almost has like a new life. Mm -hmm. And so this particular print, I donated on behalf of Laundromat Project because I really love this work and I wanted to share it with the world. Mm -hmm. And I want to support a nonprofit. So I thought that this work went in line with not only supporting the organization, but in conversation with my overall ideas around my work, which is about kind of casting light on things that I think do not always have a platform of visibility. And the, um, the nonprofit, uh, making prints for nonprofits, can you say a few words about that? Because it's something you've done frequently within, within your work and, and why print maybe is such a wonderful, not just the multiplicity of, of, of prints, but um, how does it function? Why is it important for you? 
I think that as a, as a an artist who you know, as you become more established and your price point rises to a certain level, you still want to be connected to communities who may or may not be able to support where you are in the market now, but you might want them to have some part of your practice that's tangible. Mm -hmm. And with a nonprofit support, usually the prints are based on their audience. Mm -hmm. You know, the scale of the print is based on their audience. The, the amount of production is based on that. You know, if you're working with a nonprofit who has a, has a, has a very um, modest budget, then a print might just be a two color silk screen, mm -hmm. you know, because that means the manpower has to go into it. And so you have to think about all these things when you think about printmaking, like, okay, you want to do a print, but what is your budget? I always ask them that. What is your budget to do a print if you're a nonprofit? Do you want to, I've even learned so much in having conversations with nonprofits, like, do you want to do a silk screen? And then I say, do you want to do digital? And then when they say they don't know, I say, well, I'm going to put you in contact with the print shop. And then when the print shop gives them the price, then they'll usually come back <laughs> with the most reasonable uh, <laughs> idea because they sometimes they see prints at print sh uh, fairs like this and don't realize the process and the layering and all the involvement. And then when they get the numbers, they realize like, this, oh, this is actually can be expensive, mm -hmm. depend on what we want. So it also balances out, but my whole idea of doing prints and the reason behind it is because it has to do with accessibility mm -hmm. and also it's another culture. It's another part of the culture in fine art where people actually like prints. They actually like the pristine quality of a print on the wall versus some other um, types of output. I've even had like a crazy experience where a collector bought a collage from me and my collage work is not as clean as a print. Like it's, you might see my print, my thumbprint or something on the print, and he didn't want it. <laughs> he was like, I do not want this work. It's not, it's not as professional as I thought and pristine as, you know, I really feel like, and then he bought a print <laughs> from the same series that I donated for something else, and he bought a print, and he wanted to print more because he didn't like that the paper had like a little crease in it, Yes. that it had like little push pin, mm -hmm. um, like circles on the top. And he was really disappointed. He said, I'm really disappointed in this work because this is amateurish. That's what he said. And, he, and then he contacted the gallery and said, I'll just take that print, um, which is from that series, because he felt that it looked more like he imagined the work to look in person. So I think prints feel a certain type, level of perfection mm -hmm. for people who want that on their wall, because I don't always do that when I'm making unique works in my studio. Well, that, that go also moves to the next series um, that you made with Imminence Grease. You worked with Michael and Andre on the Queen of, of, of Spaces. And I think these works also, I mean, in first impression, I think most of us would think that was was a, a collage of cut paper and, and that it would have the textural that your, your um, collector said was unprofessional or... Okay. Yeah. Well, the, so. well, the original one does. Yes. Uh, um, I think, again, this was for, you know, working with Michael, who I also love, and one of the beginning people I work with on prints. This is a digital mm -hmm. print, but it's, uh, it's printed from an original work. And so the original work has these collage elements on it, which I actually like sometimes with... Also, when it comes to digital, it has to do with the quality of the printer mm -hmm. and the quality of the paper. So it's still a process that is really embedded in like mm -hmm. a tech, in the technology of printmaking now. Mm -hmm. So what I like about ha uh, working with a really um, high quality printer is that you really get to see the shadow of the rays mm -hmm. from the original collage. When you, based on the photographic image, mm -hmm. if the printer can actually read all of those little uh, that information, you can get a sense of space just with looking at that image and the sense of texture. And this particular piece, which is part of a smaller, it was actually like a, the queen of spades. It was, it was, it was a, like, a, like a package thing and, and a book binding thing with literature. Mm -hmm. So it was like part of a whole um, kind of installment of prints and, and writing. Mm. And this leads us, as people can see, the, um, the playing card motif to game changing which yeah. is when I first met you and first saw you you making prints at an event at the, the Lower East Side print shop. And um, I was wondering if you could say a few words about, about this set, which is uh, 
which is very different than the works you've made before with in prints. Yeah, um, well, this particular work, and again, I always ask myself when I'm asked to do a print, to be physically in a print shop, is like, what would I not, what would I not get bored with mm -hmm. if I have to work on something for a long period of time and work with other people? Also, you know, communicating, like if you're working in a print shop, you have to communicate your ideas with people and they have to have some idea of what you're trying to achieve with the final thing. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, and also I, th I think about performance collage as a, as a, as a performative thing. Mm -hmm. Like I think of, of as collage as being very physical and responsive and all those things. So when I first uh, was invited to Lower East Side to do a print, um, in meeting with the master printer, Eric, at the time, they basically told me, like, think of the most outlandish or thing that you would, would uh, want to make. And so I presented all of these different ideas. And one of the ideas was eye candy that's out there, mm -hmm. which was way too ambitious for the first project <laughs> because they also a nonprofit and they had to make money. So they was like, oh, we don't really want, we can't really do this big project. We don't have that financial structure. What about something else? So I also uh, presented this idea because I had just started, you know, working on these collages, and I wanted to do something that was also about kind of thinking differently about visual language and visual culture, and that, that's kind of consistent in my work. And I always try to whatever I'm doing, if it's sculpture or painting or whatever, I still try to bring it home to what I'm I feel passionate about. And I think that the way to really change the way that people see things is by changing what they see. Mm -hmm. And so this was really a great project to just change some very simplistic area of, of this imagery as it related to things that I also was interested in with history. And I was also trying to think about bringing into the visual uh, conversation histories that may not necessarily be uh, highlighted, but, but histories that are somehow in line with the time of this original imagery, which would be the more the Renaissance, thinking about um, the Moorish uh, um, culture, thinking about other alternatives for people to access in art. And so when I was able to do that, and thinking about you know artists again, like I'm very inspired by like Bearden mm -hmm. and Jacob Lawrence and you know, Emma Amos and um, uh, Louis Milo Jones, this uh, profile images. So I was really uh, taking advantage of all of my inspiration and all of the artists I'm looking at in a way of creating something unique. And one was really great about this experience is that when I started talking to Eric about what I wanted to do and this playing card, and I didn't even think of the title, but I realized it's what the title was after I made it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he said to me, do you want to print it on real playing card stock? I was like, oh, you can do that? <laughs> he was like, yeah, I'll go online and see where we can get paper from. Mm -hmm. And he, he found this place in, I think, Italy or somewhere. It was like a, a, a stack of paper that was like somewhere in storage or whatever was the last amount of it. And he got it. And that ended up being the card stock that made it more conceptual for me. Mm -hmm. And then he said, you want to round the edges? Like a, I was like, yes, we can do that. He said, yes, we have this tool that we can like cut everything mm -hmm. precise. And then I was like, so it was like make a wish. <laughs> you know. And then we were working on stuff, working on the color. And then I was like, yeah, I really want to make the gold really pop. And, um, and I, you know, maybe we can use some real gold metallic. He was like, what about gold leaf? And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So he was like, yes, we can use that. So then we. You know, so all the things I was thinking about, if anything, I would say that working with a master printer is almost like beyond what you may think as an artist of what could be achieved in printmaking because they know all the materials. They know all of the things that work and don't work. And so it's almost like they cut right to the chase mm -hmm. and what is possible. And so this ended up being the result of the print. We were really working. And what I did is basically I bought uh, playing cards and I just cut them all up in pieces and then I glued them all back together mm. on the original piece. And I inserted this other cut paper, which are the, the silhouette, the profiles 
but all of the pieces for the most part came from the original cards that I just reassembled and glued them back down to create a different pattern and a different image. And here you can see signing the edition and the works were on view in 2015. Oh, the work was made in 2015. It was recently on view at, at the Met, as you can see. So I was wondering if we could um, say a few words also about Sing It Like You Mean It and, and this set that you, that you made. This was for Joseph Editions, and this corresponds to your live and in color series that you explored in a variety of other different formats. Well, this particular um, print edition that will all also happen to be digital mm -hmm. was created solely digitally um, instead of doing it from uh, original, unique work. Mm -hmm. And so this was the first time I actually really exercised my muscle in just creating an Im image with, with, that was in line with the previous edition, I mean, our previous series, which was called Live and in Color. Mm -hmm. And Live and in Color, what was really interesting about that series is that it was the structure of that series was to create the environment around the figure that it was reflective of the color bar calibrations, mm -hmm. but also including some, instead of using light, to use a color bar um, um, calibrations to also reflect onto the, onto the figure. Mm -hmm. So the figure and the light that I, and the colors that I use were too, you know, straightforward through looking at the calibrations that establish the color we look at on television. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, interesting to work digitally because I was interested, because I really just focused on how to be really restricted in what um, palette I could use, but seeing how to push through um, making these works solely in the computer and have them, um, you know, produced. Mm -hmm. and, um, and again, a lot of the titles of my work come like way after I make the work because I'm thinking about, I say to myself all the time, what is this saying to me? What am I, what is it, you know? And I think about that when, before I let the work come out, leave out of my studio. So I look at things and I think like, okay, what, is it, what does it mean? And so I like to talk about the titles because they're always so funny to me, but I grew up on a choir and uh, until I was like 20, singing with my family uh, in church. And, um, and I had an aunt who, you know, I led songs, my fam different people in my family led songs. It was like, we were like a, uh, one of those gospel families, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I had an aunt who was very, you know, she was singing, leading a song, and she turned around to us in the choir and said, sing it like you mean it. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of my other aunts said to her, to us, sing it like you mean it. Mm -hmm. But it was a joke. It was a joke, yeah. Um, but um, so that's kind of what I, I felt when I was looking at this work, because I, I felt that there's certain things that we look forward to in entertainment. And this whole body of work was about the black, black figure and representation on, in media and how, you know, for these particular images, I used for the whole series where like a very heightened form of expression being uh, projected outward to the viewer. So all the images from this series that were made from collage mm -hmm. and this particular digital format was really talking about that high moment of performance for the black figure on television where that's the most captivating part of looking. And also sometimes it can be the most problematic for me looking um, and seeing and being able to accept that as entertainment or reject it. So, that, that series of work was really more personal because it was me dealing with looking at black representation in the media and compartmentalizing how to like it and how to deal with it. And I think that's something that as black people we do all the time. We look at things that are problematic that has to do with our representation and we have to like, we have the first trauma of it like, Ugh, like I can't believe this. And then we look at it like, oh, okay, I gotta look at this. <laughs> You know, and I felt like, you know, that's what this series was about. It's about mm -hmm. dealing with media and being okay with things, or not being okay, but highlighting that part of the culture. And so, um, and it was for, you know, um, a nonprofit as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
as was uh, this could all be yours, which was made for Skohegan, an organization you're very you're very close to, and um, this is a screen print. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. Huh. Um, so the, huh. you use screen print with this too, and it, it's interesting that you use the old old televisions. We're going to have to add uh, an explanation that there used to be TVs with knobs and channels, and and uh, I feel like we're dating ourselves, but um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going the way of the horse-drawn carriage. Um, but it's 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 interesting. I was wondering if you could say a little bit, as you talked about um, about pop culture too. Well, I think the TV frame is also very much part of the culture that we, is a portal that we look at things, just like a frame around of art, artwork, the types of frame that goes on artwork gives it a sense of, of, of time, mm -hmm. um, taste, all those things, because it's kind of framing something that is uh, either distracting from what you're looking at or is bringing you towards it. And so I like the history. I use the old television frame um, because I want to talk about like the history of media mm -hmm. and not, I want the TV to be very substantial in the reading of the work and talk about the history of media and television and the nostalgic part of it. And so in this particular work, I really wanted the frame to be there because I want to also talk about the way that the, the knobs suggest a certain way that we control what we look at. Mm -hmm. Like we have the power to change the channel mm -hmm. and it's physical and it has to do with your, um, your reaction to things and how you feel about what is presented to you. So I wanted the TV monitor, the TV frame to talk about, you know, the same way you look at, again, the way you look at like a um, Rococo frame or, mm -hmm. you know, which also has to do with another level of taste or era. I wanted to bring this in because for me, I grew up when TVs looked like this, and I actually remember winning a TV um, because I sold like a lot of candy at my school, elementary school, and so you get all these things, and one thing that I got was like a television, which was a big deal um, to win a television at elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so for me, the TV is always, well, the idea of it has been an impression on me since that time because even when I wanted, wanted a TV at that, that age, I didn't really realize it was such an important thing to win um, until the people around me made a big deal over it. Because again, like in the early 70s, mid 70s, like kids knew TV, but they weren't like drawn to it. It was still like, we were still outside doing stuff. So, and I think it was a black and white TV. I don't think it was even color, but I won it in the candy sale. So. That's like the TV, that's the TV frame. And um, maybe that's the reason why I made it like that. It's interesting too, thinking of the impact of, of television as Brandon Joseph has written about with Rauschenberg, the idea that the same image can be in multiple homes concurrently because of the TV, especially when we had you know, three or five stations versus uh, <laughs> yeah. versus now, it could be the exact same image. And so that's something also that I think relates to, to prints. And again, that there is a multiple, it can be on view at the Met, it can be in someone's home, it can be, yeah. um, it can exist concurrently in different situations and take on different meaning if it's in a group show, a solo show, or, or how it, it's installed. And I think that's kind of also where this print kind of works really well with the idea of media and being in many different places. And this subject that's happening is a game show. Mm -hmm. And um, I was really excited. You know, a lot of the things that I make, they're really more about how I want the viewer to feel looking at it. And I, in these particular, for people who grew up around their grandparents watching um, game shows, um, they really get this piece. <laughs> I grew up watching game shows. Even if I walked through the house in my grandmother's house, they would be watching game shows. And the excitement of it was always so interesting to me because that was not part of my culture. That was a culture prior to me being there, but I still had to experience it because I did not own the TV. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to kind of represent that in this particular work because honestly, when I'm making things, sometimes I think about my family um, how they would respond to that. Like, mm -hmm. I channel their 
whatever in my work. Even if they don't see it, they're in it. They're in it in some type of way. The memory, the influence. The memory, the experience of it, mm -hmm. being in the space, you know, just being, you know, my grandmother watched like the soap operas and she would just, sometimes she would, um, one thing that I remember, sometimes she would like be really sad and I would ask her like, what's, what's wrong? Why? You know, and she would say, I say, I say, are you crying because it's television? And she was like, yeah, but it's more than that. <laughs> it's that people really like this out here in the world. Yeah. Who are terrible. Yes. As they're like these characters on TV. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. yeah. And these are these are two prints that you also made um, with Michael again at Eminence Greece. So figure walking into the light, man and woman. And also interior life woman and interior life man. And we've spoken a little bit about um, working digitally, but maybe, you know, deconstruction and construction is so important to your work. And in some ways it seems to mirror the, the printmaking process of taking an image, breaking down an image, building back. And um, we'll talk about that with some of the processed uh, photographs that we have, but I was wondering if you could say a little bit about maybe how the influence of printmaking, if you feel it's had influence on your work and other, other mediums, other techniques? Well, I, I will say that working digitally with a, with a master printer is very different than just printing something somewhere. Mm -hmm. And a master printer can make the comparison between what is silk screen and what is um, wood block and other physical processes or uh, procedures in making a print and compare it to the outcome of a digital print and be able to judge whether the quality is high or low in a way that sending your work to a regular printer.com to print something would not happen. Mm -hmm. So I so working with Andre, who used to be, you know, the head print uh, printmaker at Pace mm -hmm. at one time, um, I just felt confident that even though we were doing a digital process, it would still appear that it had the quality of a screen image. Mm -hmm. And so these particular works were both works I, was, I made in my studio, physical collage works. And so these are works that I keep. Mm -hmm. Most of the prints that, I, that are in the world, the original works are on my wall at home or in my storage because I just love that piece and I want to hold on to it um, and not sell it to the gallery or whatever, through the gallery. So, but I want people to see what I think is my favorite work. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you buy a print of my work, you should know that this is usually a piece that I have at home in my private collection mm -hmm. and not owe it to any collector. Because if I sell a work to a collector, I will not make a print of it, of the work. But if a work I have in my, my own personal collection, if I'm making a series of portraits, if I make 20 portraits, at least two I'm gonna keep, or three or four, and those works are works that people would never see if I did not make a print of them. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I love to have opportunity to come and work with a master printer to translate things that I love to make sure that they look like what I love, even though it's not the unique work. Mm -hmm. And here you are signing. What does signing of the, the work mean for you? We had a photo earlier of, of signing Game Changing. Um, the end. That's <laughs> a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And, you know, and I always feel like it's coming to, uh, you know, a complete, mm -hmm. you know, signing because, again, I'm doing prints while I'm also doing other things. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing, I'm preparing for a show or I'm teaching and all these different things. So, you know, it's just one extra thing that, um, you have to do, you know, you have to, you know, when people say like being an established artist is a lot of different parts of doing that, which means that you have to be in a lot of different head spaces to do things. So signing, you know, you have to make sure again, like you have to make time and have to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. Like you, you know, you can't just sign it crazy. You have to like, if you sign it crazy, you gotta sign it crazy all those times. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. Those things are something that you learn as you, you know, as you're doing the process. But I actually enjoy printmaking and working with uh, with printmaking um, organizations a lot because it actually gives me like 
a different headspace of working because I have to work with other people. Like it's something you have to do. Like in my studio, I do have assistants, but I have to do I have to do a lot, mm-hmm. and and a lot of stuff is done when no one's in my studio. So have at a print in a print shop working with a master printer, they're part of the, the beginning of what you're doing all the way to the end of what you're doing. Absolutely. You know? So we're moving to shark float and turtle floats. They're both part of your uh, floater series. And you've spoken about both the joy of the present and depicting leisure as a political act. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about that. Well, the thing is, you know, just the idea of that frame of mind really came about for me in my time at grad school. Because when I was at Columbia, a lot of my work was really talking about the different facets of black culture and the social dynamics that exist in many different places where black people reside. And that the world, I felt the world was really missing out on the complexity of black culture because of the nuances that they were not privy to based on the structure of media and different things. Mm-hmm. I just felt that you know, being a black person, growing up in Baltimore, for instance, like Baltimore is like bigger than The Wire, for people who know The Wire. But I'm not saying that's not a part of Baltimore, but I think what's interesting to me about Baltimore is driving down a very particular area and seeing old black people on that porch waving to you who don't even know you when they see you see them (laughs) see you driving down that street. Like people don't think of that as a movie, but when I drive through those neighborhoods in Baltimore, I'm like, that could be a movie. Mm -hmm. This could be a show. But this is boring to people, so they don't want to see that. But I think that is more interesting to me because that's something that's more unique. And honestly, I think that's more political place to look at black culture when it deals with things that are not expected Mm -hmm. um, and that people would have to also deal with boring black people, which I think is some people should deal with too. Like we should always have to be exciting for people. Like we could just be black people sitting on our porch Drinking lemonade. Like, I think that that's a place that should reflect in art. And I think that people should be forced to look at that as well as other things. And so my position in grad school started like that because I didn't even know I was making things that were political Mm -hmm. when I was making work like that in grad school. But the response to my work was so so reactionary in a negative way because I was making that type of work Mm -hmm. in grad school that I started to really think about, maybe I'm making something interesting. Mm -hmm. If people who are responding so um, negatively about what I'm doing, and they're not asking me why am I doing it, or trying to understand, you know, that this is not something that's actually common Mm -hmm. in 2001. It was not as common as it is now in art. But when I was making the work, it was a lot of contention about my willingly ignoring certain things that people felt were pressing to talk about in art. And I think that this is really pressing because I think that this is what we aspire to like every other cultural group. And these are things that we participate in. So it's not like I'm creating fantasy. These are experiences that people are not highlighting because they may not seem exciting to people. Mm -hmm. But to me, they're exciting and tangible. So. The floater series kind of came out of the idea of like really thinking about first what the black people I know want to see and the people who support the type of things I want to see who aren't black will want to support. So that's what I started making work thinking like everybody couldn't want to see trauma. You know, like I don't think the black people need to, I don't think black people need to see that. Like honestly, I think that trauma is something that is innately part of a norm, normalized culture in our society. And as a black man walking outside, obviously I know I'm susceptible to any type of trauma. And so if I'm in my studio, I'm not gonna make work that's not gonna uplift me or empower me. I'm gonna make work that will bring another conversation about the black experience into the mainstream world because I'm at a place where I could do that as an artist because also I have the ability to to imagine other worlds beyond what is being projected to me. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of how it came out with the Floater series. I wanted to make portraits of black figures in a way that talked about, you know, lightness, Mm -hmm. you know, levitation. The water could also be seen as sky or air. 
I wanted to really simplify the, the blue background, not to necessarily convey a sense of water in a literal way. I wanted to really strip it down and really think about what blue means to different people. What, what does that color blue that I mix mean to a viewer? It could mean air, it could mean water. Floating, I didn't say swimmers, I said floaters. That means that it has to do with less weight. And so I wanted to give people less weight. And so it was very deliberate in the, in the concept of that work that could also look, be looked at as, you know, something that is not as heavy, but also um, it doesn't have to be heavy if you don't see it as being heavy. I mm -hmm. think that we as black artists should be able to make whatever we want. And because I think that everything we make has political undertone. So I don't think that deliberately being political is always the most um, productive and you don't necessarily get the results that you want sometimes. Mm -hmm. I personally think that the way that things are structured in our society is that people kind of expect us to be that type of artist mm -hmm. when we're put in the context of a museum show or a gallery show. They kind of look for that place for us to be and they expect it. So it doesn't have the same level of shock mm -hmm. or the things that it might have had in the 90s or the other times when it was so pressing when you wouldn't see those works in museums or galleries. Now it's more, pretty much expected. So I think that what I'm trying to create or what I've been able to create for myself is for me a break for black people to come and to see themselves and not feel so exposed when they're in a space where the trauma that they face is put on the walls for other people to also experience it in front of them. I wanna give black viewers the ability to look at the museum in the same way that other people look at the museum as a place of leisure and education. Mm -hmm. And I think about those things as an artist and as an educator. So I channeled those things when I was in grad school and I never even thought that they were considered political until I started to look at it in the way that things was, be the way people were responding to my work um, and how they felt there were things that I was not acknowledging within the culture that they felt was really pressing for me to talk about. And here's a, a photo of you, of you working. Can you describe a little bit about the working process for this series? One thing that's really the most important to me after establishing the image or working off the image is the palette. Mm -hmm. Like I'm really into color. If you look at my work, color is something that's very well thought out, tested, and so, that's the fun part to see, like, going to a paint, you know, because also you're using ink versus like acrylic paint in my studio. So going to a, to a, a print lab or, or a print, uh, organization and trying to mix a color to match the color you use in your studio, mm -hmm. which is sometimes very complicated and it's time consuming, but it's also a thing that I enjoy because it just has to do with like slowing down. And so when you go into a, uh, a place, you look at color, and actually it actually helps me in my studio when I'm actually painting because I'm thinking about some of the kind of um, the set procedures that happen in printmaking that has to happen mm -hmm. in order for the print to be communicated to what the artist is trying to achieve and that the print master printer understands the, you know, the things that you're trying to establish. Mm -hmm. So that relationship is so important because they have to know like a cool, like a cool blue, or warm blue. Mm -hmm. Like, they have to look at your work before you get to the print shop and see like, no, I know Derek wouldn't want to use this blue, mm -hmm. so I'm not gonna waste his time pulling out these shades to show him when he gets there. And they'll say to you like, this is kind of, I looked at your work, I went to the show and saw this, I saw this color colors, I'm thinking that this is kind of more in line with what your colors are, mm -hmm. you know, this is the whatever, then you go, we mix it, we experiment a little bit on it, but it's also like an opportunity to change your mind mm -hmm. because sometimes I might use a color that's not in my original palette because this is now an opportunity to do something different. And I think that this particular print, oh, sorry. Um, that print ended up being very different than um, that series because it was very loose, mm -hmm. the way that I uh, was able to make the paint and make the work for the, and this was a silk screen work, um, with uh, with the Lower East Side Print Shop, and so you you worked with Eric for this, yeah, and then you moved to you you did some work at, at Tandem, and I'm showing yes. 
This was a, a more recent photograph. You can see a variety of, of prints on, on view. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the difference in experience of, of what it is going to, to tandem or to um, another workshop that's in that's outside of New York, because the Lower East Side is in New York, you live in New York, and just what it means to go away to make a print. Well, you know, the setup and just the overall, um, like, production is very different, the Lower East Side. You know, space is definitely an issue in New York when you think about print shops and how things are laid out. Mm -hmm. um, and manpower was more limiting at Lower East Side print shop just because the financial structure is different. Mm -hmm. But with Tandem, you know, it was just like, just leaving New York mm -hmm. kind of slowed me down, like leaving out of the city to work on a print. And I was recommended uh, to Tandem by my good friend, Michaeline Thomas, who mm -hmm. also works with Tandem. And so just the idea of being rec uh, recommended from my good friend kind of set like a really um, relaxed, almost like um, just, it was, it was a very, like a, like a very seamless uh, transition from working with Lower East Side Print Shop to working with Tandem and seeing all of the, the experienced people at Tandem who just specialize in different things, mm -hmm. you know? Like uh, Lower East Side, a lot, you know, there are head uh, master printers, but there are a lot of different people filling in, mm -hmm. assisting the master printer, but at Tandem, there were people who specialize in this type of process. And there was like one guy who like makes the frame or work on the frame, it was like all these different people working with mm -hmm. me, the artist, trying to figure out how to present my work in the best way. And the timing was a little bit more spread out. Like it was just, mm -hmm. the time wasn't as condensed. In New York, things are more condensed. So Tandem was like getting, like taking a vacation and making art on the vacation. So for, yeah. this is a, a massive undertaking for self-portrait on float. It's woodblock, gold leaf, and collage. And, um, this was made with Jason Rule and Joe Fry, whose work we'll, we'll be seeing. Um, but I wonder if you could describe this experience a little, and then I'll, I'll be flipping through with um, images of, of how it was produced. Because was this your first time working with wood? Yes. Um, so again, the best thing about working with master printers is that you tell them your ideas, and then I think they like making work for themselves. Mm -hmm. Like I think that master printers always make things more complicated for themselves just to see like <laughs> if I can do this, like I can do this thing. And so when we started talking about what I want to do for the print, and we start, I started talking with, talking to the master printers at Tandem, they were like, we just got this machine in, you know, it's a wood block, you know, blah blah blah. We're gonna try this new machine. I'm like, okay. It was like it's gonna be a hundred pieces. I'm like, wow, okay. Um, so it was like all those different things mm -hmm. that. I knew, like, I'm not experienced at doing that. But my job was to start the process of what would, what would soon be a great outcome. And so I came to mix the paint. I came to work on the test prints, to do those things, and to make sure that the colors were in relationship to what I wanted to see, to kind of, you know, mess around a little bit with the paints and work on, like, establishing the format, the composition. and. When I really, and they told me like how it would be, how they want to do it. And honestly, I thought it was going to just be a so screen, but when they mm -hmm. told me that it's going to be woodblock and that it was going to be like 100 pieces, mm -hmm. I knew it was out of my league <laughs> to be a part of that conversation. So I was able to help in a way that I could as an artist by establishing like the basic format of what the outcome would be. So we talked about the gold leaf, mm -hmm. the collage elements. Um, kind of organizing the compositional things. Also, there's things that when you're going back and forth through the Illustrator file, going back and forth, there's things that could, you can miss. So it's really more like I was uh, somewhat of like a, like a director after I left Tandem, mm -hmm. after we spent like two or three days there working on the, the test print, then going back was really more about Tandem sending me the test print and then signing off on it and like tweaking the colors. But mm -hmm. it became like a you know long relationship of just back and forth, but it was like the most ambitious print I've ever worked on. 
Well, it really is. Um, it's, as you said, over 100 carvings, six runs. There's a wonderful video online from the Hudson River Museum where they talk with uh, Joe and Jason and they show some of the, the laser cut and some of the materials. But, um, and they tell a great story about when they, they broke down, of breaking it down and building it up again. And um, here you can see, as you said, directing and the process and then signing. <laughs> yeah. And that's the finished yeah. the finish yeah. print. And then you also made Boy on Swan Float. Yes. Around this time with Tandem. Another wood block. Another wood block. Yeah. And this had screen print too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always like all these different processes, wood block, screen print, collage. I didn't, I honestly, I would have done printmaking in this way a long time ago. If I thought like collage could be a, if I thought it could be multiple things happening, I would have probably started probably um, doing like undergrad, like after undergrad. If I thought, because I was taught really traditional ways of printmaking, like copper etchings, mm -hmm. those types of things. I thought that was like the traditional way of doing it. If I knew you can like throw collage on each one and do all these different things, I would have probably, that probably would have been my practice from the beginning. And then you, also worked in, in screen print again with the Lower East Side, and this relates very much to, unfortunately I don't have an image of it, but the um, your project for the Harlem uh, Pediatric uh, Hospital also. And it uses the similar images from the floaters. And can you talk about why um, why you chose that for, for the hospital also? Well, I was invited just for a tour of the Pediatric Hospital, Harlem mm -hmm. Hospital, probably like 2019 or maybe a little earlier. And so I met the head of the hospital. We walked through the ward. We talked about like um, her vision. Mm -hmm. Like she didn't tell me like what to make, but she just said that, listen, the kids who come in here don't want to be here, mm -hmm. number one. So that's one thing you should automatically think about, that no one comes in here out of volunteering to be here. Mm -hmm. It's not an art gallery. It's something that is kind of dealt with trauma. And so anything that can relieve them from that experience would be great. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, I started to think about just the symbolism in my work more so than the narrative of my work and the mm -hmm. things that people respond to in various ways and what kids could respond to. And also thinking like a kid. Mm -hmm. I think of anything, I became way more um, thoughtful mm -hmm. in this process to think less like Derek and think more like Derek now and more like Derek as a child. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about what types of imagery I would like to create that I would maybe want to see as a kid. Then, so I started thinking about things that had like a participatory feeling mm -hmm. to it and not necessarily put the figures on the floaties, mm -hmm. but put the floaties in relationship to the figure to give it some type of relational aesthetic that you could actually be on these things too or these things are something that can be activated by your mind, mm -hmm. your imagination, and it's not any type of instructional imagery that show you how to get on them. Mm -hmm. So, and also I was thinking about the idea of a pattern or a mm -hmm. grid, and so it ended up being a wallpaper, I think six of the rooms mm -hmm. in the um, hospital, and the demographics for that hospital are mostly black kids and kids of color, and so I was really mindful of just the idea of representation, how impactful that could be for young kids who are distressed. And so I made it in relationship to who the client was. Mm -hmm. And after I made the wallpaper, I realized that no one would see it mm -hmm. because it's in a hospital for kids. Mm -hmm. And if unless you have a kid and you live in that place and hopefully you don't want your kid to go there because mm -hmm. that means it's a pediatric ward. So I decided to contact Lower East Side Print Shop and ask them would they be interested in collaborating with me to still screen these images that I use for the wallpaper mm -hmm. to make them available, but also using some of the, the proceeds to get back to RX Art, mm -hmm. which commissioned me to do the piece. And so I wanted to give the money back because with commissioning artists, they don't really make money. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that they recoup some of their profit, I mean losses from doing this project with me and arranging the staff. So I said, you know, I gave them a percentage of the sale, but also this was like the first really large scale 
single work. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one, you know, single work, but multiple panels mm -hmm. that I did. And this is, again, is always a challenge. I think for artists, as you start establishing yourself and, you know, and gaining the confidence and the relationship with print, with print uh, publishing, they can work with you in taking risks to present projects that may be a little bit more ambitious than the last project. Mm -hmm. And that's what this project was to me. It was like a way of doing something that was a little bit more ambitious than the single objects that we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. And there was always, sometimes always a little bit of hesitation because it's a lot of manpower in producing multiple panel works mm -hmm. that will make it more challenging to sell, mm -hmm. especially from a nonprofit space or support. But I was able to convince the print, the print shop I said, it's going to do good, just trust me. They were like, what if we want to just do one? So one, I said, no, that's all we sold together. I know you can do it. I know it. I know you can do it. I just feel it. And it was very successful. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, and it was really important because I even said to them, well, take everything that you have to make, that you need to make out first. Mm -hmm. So, and then when you, pay, when you get all of that back, your half or whatever, then the rest could be mine. And so they were able to do that. So I knew it. I just sensed it. And when they did, they called me from the fair and it was like, you were right. Everything we have is sold. You know, all we have is your stuff now. Mm -hmm. And do you want me to sell your stuff um, now that we've already recouped all of our mm -hmm. expenses? And I was like, yeah, you know, but it was really more like thinking like now that we're in this space and printmaking is becoming such a accessible and more prominent mm -hmm space, now artists can do more things that can highlight the possibilities of printmaking that not, cannot necessarily exist in the unique object mm -hmm. world that could be just as or more of something you might want to have mm -hmm. than a unique thing that's a singular object. You can do more ambitious things like the wallpaper mural mm -hmm. that's a piece in itself, mm -hmm. you know? And, and you're on the board of RX Art too. Yeah, so usually when I do these things, I end up joining the board. I was, yeah, something happened. I don't know. I was getting brought into the board. But I end up joining the board, which I love. But, you know, again, like, I think just being that type of artist and really thinking about your relationship with nonprofit organizations on a longer trajectory mm -hmm. makes it more in line for them asking you to be on the board, you know. So I... I'm conscious of the time, so I wanted to say, just show some works. We have Kings on Vacation and Party Guest, um, which was also made at, at Tandem and involves um, collage. And again, in the, the, the video that the Hudson uh, River Museum makes, they show a little bit of the, the process of creation, the fabric and the, the hats. And, and how that worked. And it seemed like they have a lot of projects going um, concurrently. Here's a little bit of, and I wonder if you could say just a few words about those series and then we'll move into style variations and, and eye candy. Well, I wanna go back to the um, Kings on Vacation sure. first. Um, okay, so the Kings on Vacation was a print that I just established to make for myself, but it also is a print that is um, supporting my nonprofit in Baltimore, the mm -hmm. last resort, and all the other things. But this is a print that I kind of self published, but I did it with Lower East Side Print Shop. And the motivation of doing this, if anyone's seen my work um, based on the Green Book archive research, mm -hmm. which is called Sanctuary, I was really interested in like the time frame of the Green Book and the, the, the way it operated, but also was interested also um, in the lack of images of civil rights leaders that don't, do not really betray them at a leisurely, a, in a leisurely frame of imagery. Like, you don't really see, there are images on Google of these, these leaders, but they're not prominent images. Mm -hmm. And today you can see the reaction to people when they see a prominent political person on vacation. People love it. They love when they see Michelle with some shorts on and a straw hat. <laughs> like, of course she's gonna have that on. Like, every, like she's not gonna wear a suit every day. But the way that people respond to political leaders being at leisure is to me another layer of understanding the complexity of political, especially political black leaders, is that they also have a life that is about joy and about their family. And that's something that we should also acknowledge as even more so because you don't really think of those types of people having those moments 
But if they didn't have those moments, they wouldn't be the people that we see them to be. Because human, human nature, you need to balance things as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And so this, 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 this two, you know, two uh, works kind of came out of looking at the kings in a different way based on images I've seen of them and then kind of reimagining what they would look like in this leisurely mm -hmm. uh, position. And so that's what this particular work came about. And it was just something I wanted to make because I, I felt like I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. And so I just made this image to put it in the world as an alternative way of looking at the family. And you've spoken before about seeing the image of the kings on vacation in a, in a pool in, 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 in Jamaica. Water. In Jamaica, yeah. it was an article in Jet Magazine. I think it was Jet or Ebony, and it was the king, um, uh, Martin and his wife, I think his kids were too, and uh, Jamaica, and they were at a resort, mm -hmm. and it was published about his, you know, asking him about his, you know, the way, how he felt being, you know, on vacation, and how he felt so relaxed and relieved. And I think, you know, I would think that would be like so political to see, mm -hmm. to see that he actually took a vacation in between all of these things, because I personally think that because of images that we don't see of those types of people in repose, is that we, and also the younger generation, feel like we don't deserve relaxation because those people did not relax and they actually did. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to show both sides of these people to show that you can actually relax and then think of strategies so when you're not relaxed that you need to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And so that was my purpose for making that work and thinking about them in the way that I constantly think about them mm -hmm. in my work. And that's how we get the party, that's how the party and plan, which mm -hmm. is that series, which was kind of inspired. I was at Rauschenberg mm -hmm. um, for a residency, and I just started working on these, these works. It was just not, I knew I was gonna have a show at Hudson River Museum, but I didn't know exactly what I was gonna make. But when I got to Rauschenberg, I started to make these party guests because I just wanted to see them in my studio. Mm -hmm. You know, I always think about what do I want to see when I turn on my lights in my studio? Like, that's your world. Like, no one should be in control of your world. Like, I know stuff is going on outside of your studio, but what do you want to see as an artist when you call on your lights? Do you want to see the things that are motivating you to be an artist, or you want to make the things that's going to stagnate you um, as an artist to not be creative and be, you know, fantastical in your practice? And so I thought, like, if I'm going to be here for five weeks, I want to create images that I look forward to when I op when I open up my studio door and I call in the lights. I'm like, hey, <laughs> hey, the party is starting. You know, I'm like that when I open my studio. I'm like, the party is starting right now, and I could be in here working. Mm -hmm. And it's not that artists can't do other work. Like the reason why I make my work is because other artists are doing things that are not my work. Mm -hmm. Like the, you, they freed me up. The work that artists are doing that they feel is overtly political that they feel like they have to do, you have to make it. If you feel like you have to make it, please do not not make it, make it. But also realize because you're making it, I don't have to. Yeah. Because I can talk about something else. And that's what contemporary art is about. It's about different people talking about different things that affect them differently. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage people, I have friends who make work very different than my work and I support their work. And I believe that their work is important, but I also believe that there should be room for multiple conversations dealing with black culture that should also share the spotlight together. And I think that a lot of things that happen within black culture happens socially, even political things. Like I think that party and plan for me came out of thinking about my friends and when we get together, how, the conversations we have. Even when someone says like, come over to my house, we have, have drinks. It always turned into a multi-layered conversation. And I'm sure it happened in other groups, cultural groups, creative groups, but I know for a fact, historically, with black people that we've all always entertained social gatherings as a place of political gatherings as well. Mm -hmm. And they just come out of nowhere. And sometimes people are like, I did not want to talk about that today. <laughs> but you can't really talk, you can't say it, because some people who come to these parties can talk about these things where they came from. So they come to the party to disrupt the party by seeing if someone at the party see, saw what they saw, mm -hmm. felt what they felt. So it might be in a barbershop, it might be in a hair salon, it might be a church, but it's normally a condition that started, you know, from, from slavery in America. If black people had to find, you know, they weren't all necessarily Christian, 
but that was the only place they could congregate and talk. So they probably used church as a political space to talk about things that they couldn't talk about in public. So I think that we've got accustomed to using social spaces for multiple things. And that's what this word kind of came out of. It's called we came to party and plan. And that's what I think what happens when I'm at a party with my friends. We're talking about everything, not just art. We rarely talk about art, actually. We talk about other stuff, like way things that are not even art related. So the, the next set um, or style variation, you have male and uh, female. Yeah. Uh, mannequins. And I think we're running short on time, but I wanted to just show a little bit of the production and then go to also to, to Eye Candy, um, which is on view and is spectacular, as well as Style Variation, which are in um, Tandem's booth. But you began with a photograph or s of, uh, yeah. of mannequins. And if you could, I'll just flip through and maybe yeah. just say a few words about what you're doing in each image. Well, the Style Variation kind of came out of uh, years of just photographing uh, storefront beauty shop windows. Mm -hmm. I have like a fixation on it. I just like how some of them look really shabby and some look really cool. And I like to see them change them. And also I learned like a lot of stuff, like I'm sure a lot of black women know this, but you know all the young black women who work at these places are the ones who are styling these mannequin heads. And I didn't really know that until I started stepping into the thing for like, you know, products or whatever. I was always see like a younger black woman and these beauty um, supplies that were usually not owned by them but they actually created the culture around the visual culture that enticed other black women to come in and buy stuff. And I would talk to them and I would go in there and they would wonder like what I did or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I would just make up stuff. I would say like I'm a stylist or I'm doing a music. Cause I, I kind of want to keep the zone of conversation. Go. I didn't want to say I'm an artist mm -hmm. because that just seems too vague in general. So I would say things that I know would be of interest of the people working there, but I got to learn the culture of the beauty shop, and I, and I became really interested in documenting the change of the window and how it related to art making. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking at the mannequin heads, which was one started from one photograph of one head that I transformed to a bunch of different looks. Mm -hmm. But what I really thought about in the structure is that it wasn't really about the mannequin itself. It was about the, the way that the styles around the mannequin transformed what you saw in the middle. Mm -hmm. And also a lot of these styles, even though they become po they've become popularized, they started off as being very DIY styles that a lot of black women in urban spaces would just do. They would just buy something, cut it up, put it on, and then now you see these styles, they have names, they're in the windows, they are now you know very expensive, and so for me, I just wanted to show like how culture elevates from this level up to this level. And then for me as an artist, I wanted to highlight these things and put it in a space to let them know that I see you mm -hmm. and that I see what you're doing. And I just wanted to let you know that I understand the power of cultural production mm -hmm. and that it's not always acknowledged through media. But for me as an artist, I had the ability to do it. But also I wanted to talk about it as it relates to painting because the styles also show different facets of the mannequin and the figure. And I changed the tones of the mannequins because the original tone was very one-sided. One, one but they, different, they have different tones, but most of the stories they have like all of the same tones. If it's darker or lighter, I wanted to take liberties as an artist to transform these objects. And so that's what the, the style variations um, kind of came from that. And that's and usually when I go to tandem, mm -hmm. it, I always do more than one thing. Mm -hmm. So you can see, I'm gonna go yeah. move very yeah. quickly through eye yeah. candy, um, but you can see a little bit of the, the um, how it was envisioned, yeah. the screen print. And if you could maybe just say a word about the about the origins for eye candy, and I'll flip through. You can see the different yeah. production stages. Well, in the beginning, this is the image that I had, I had proposed. My first, uh, I first proposed this to Lori Sire Print Shop, like over like ten years ago or something, before I did the Game Changer, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to do it, and I wanted to I wanted to do it where it was multiple panels but one piece, mm -hmm. 
And it was something that was like a little ambitious for our first engagement. But I always had it on my bucket list of this is what I wanted to do. And when I was invited by the, by the art fair to, to be commissioned to make the piece, I automatically thought about Tandem because we've been like up in our game or up in our process every time we've done something. It's always been a little bit bigger, a little bit more, a little bit more involved. And I thought they would be the perfect uh, people to work with on this project. And so this image, the, 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 the image that is, is, um, has been manipulated or been sourced was coming from a really old vintage Ebony magazine um, around like the early 70s, 60, late 60s. And it was a really small ad in the magazine that was about a couple of inches. Mm -hmm. And it was an ad for an underwear company. And it was an image that was the man, it was an image of him um, that was um, screened. Mm. And it was very pixelated because, you know, it was really old and, the, and even the technique of that time. And it was different colors of underwear. Mm. And it had, you know, the names of the underwear had like names that sound almost like flavors or something, not like colors. And I just was really drawn to it because of its provocative nature, but also the command that he pr projected out in this magazine. And because it was so little, it has such a large presence for me looking at it because, again, in this time, in this tumultuous time in the country, you know, the magazine had many other articles about politics and other things that were happening, civil rights related. And I looked at this image of this guy and I thought, this is a powerful image. Mm -hmm. And this image should be big, not small. And it should be, the color should be more vivid. Mm -hmm. And I should be able to highlight some of the things that I think are very important about looking at this man who's addressing the audience in a very particular way. And I think by having it so small, it really didn't do justice for the image. And so I was able to scan the image, keep it for a long period of time, work on it um, with the pattern and different things that are kind of embedded in the breakdown of it, but transform it to a new work. And when I decided to really push it, I thought about what it meant to me and what it really was trying to convey. And I thought of the provocative nature as being like eye candy. Like I felt like he was projecting, like I grew up where you, you would see, like when I looked at Magnum PI, I loved TC. You know what I'm saying? Like when I looked at Barney Miller, I loved the black guy with the Afro with the trench coat who was like very particular about his clothes and like, how he dressed, like that's what I remember about watching TV. The supporting characters for me were lead characters. Mm. And so I looked at them as saying like, they should have their own show, <laughs> you know? And I know at that time they could not, but I looked at those figures in that way and I looked at this particular guy in that way and I wanted to put him up in a certain place mm -hmm. because I don't even know if this was like a real person or, or a drawing of a person or whatever, but I wanted him to make him physical and I want him to be in a space where he could be confrontational in a way that he's not trying to be. And he's just being himself. And you can see here with our, our last image um, that it, the joy it brings. You can see people interacting with the, the piece. And um, it's a truly extraordinary work. It's right at the very front of the um, IFPDA. I'm sure everyone saw it coming in. I encourage you to take another look at the collage elements. I think Tandem still has the uh, lollipops, maybe, that okay. uh, such as Based on the Eye, the wonderful pun, eye candy. Um, and I think we are out of time. I don't, do we have time for questions? No, we do not. Um, so I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Derek for this incredible, thank you. Oh, thank you. incredible thank you. conversation. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Gibbs for allowing all yeah, this to you, happen. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and please um, enjoy the rest of the fair, and, um, and we hope to see you next year. Thank you.